don't you just hate it when some idiot speaker gets up and talks about some sucked sentimental sugar stick story about their sweet little kiddies at home and how there's this wonderful insight into human nature that we can derive from it. And really, it's as dull as ditch water. <laughs> so, um, the night before this talk, I was with my two boys at home, <laughs> um, having dinner with them and explaining to them why I wasn't going to be there this next weekend. The small boys, six-year-old fraternal twins, Philip and Andrew. So I tried to describe it in simple words, not fundraising, but, you know, going to speak to people to get money. And <laughs> one boy, Philip, said, he said, Dada, Dada, you're a beggar. And I said, no, I'm not a beggar. But then I thought about it, maybe I am, in a way, <laughs> should be on the street. But he was getting riled up. He then began to say, Dada, Dada, that's wrong. That's wrong. And he said, I said, no, it's not wrong. He said, it's really wrong. It's really wrong. And he was doing this with his hands. So he is a quarter Italian. I'm half Italian. So, so I said, what do you mean, Philip? You know, <laughs> it's not wrong. You know, there's nothing wrong in that. He said, yes, it is. Look, you're going to talk to them. They'll give you all their money, and they'll end up homeless. <laughs> and that's really bad for them. And I thought, I tried to explain to him. It, it, it won't quite go that way. Um, but on the other hand, seriously, if any of you do end up homeless, these are hard times, you can come and live with us on Locust on 41st Street on Penn Campus, and you can share Philip's bedroom. He will <laughs> sure. be delighted to give it to you. But what I want to get to is that this is a boy with empathy and compassion and feeling. Now, the other boy, Andrew, <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say he's a psychopath. That would be a very harsh thing for a parent to say. But on the other hand, he was looking at this and he said, money, tell him to give some of it to me. <laughs> so the issue is that what I want to get to firmly is that people are different. Look, same environment, different genes mixing together. But these boys are very different. One boy very empathic, feeling, has a sense of people. The other boy is a little bit different at the get-go. And he didn't ask for that. And I'm going to talk about work on individuals who also didn't ask for the genes they got or the brain predispositions that they got. And the question is, where does that lead us to? Quickly, I'll look at brain structural functional abnormalities in murderers and offenders. Secondly, I'll turn to that issue that Amy was talking about, neural circuits in the brain underlying moral decision making. And thirdly, I'll try and turn to these neuroethical and legal issues. Well, first of all, on brain structure function. The great thing, I used to be in England, I went to um, University of Southern California 20 years ago. One of the reasons is that you can study murderers in Los Angeles, not so many in England, there's plenty in Los Angeles. We were able to round up 41 murderers, put them in the scanner, and you know, this is a long time ago, it's 15 years ago now. So you know, we have known this for quite some time. You know, looking down on the brain here, normal individual, down on the brain, bird's eye view, Good activation of that prefrontal cortex that you've heard about earlier today, the control regulatory part of the brain, which is absent in individuals who commit homicide. So some message there that perhaps poorer functioning of that very frontal part of the brain, which is involved in emotion regulation and emotion control and good decision making may be dysfunctional in uh, aggressive, antisocial, even uh, seriously violent individuals. Not all murderers are the same, and the caveat here. For example, this is a single impulsive murderer lacking that frontal executive function. But the man in the middle killed 64 people in a 12-year period without being caught. And here you see excellent activation of the frontal cortex. Why? Because, of course, he was able to carefully plan, regulate, and control his behavior without being caught for almost 12 years. So the caveat here, it's not one size fits all. Another caveat here, there's another brain scan, which, if you look at it, looks really quite like that of the serial killer here. You can look at those patterns there that we were l looking at this morning. You make the comparison yourself here. And I think you'd agree it's more like the serial killers than mine, than, 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 than that one. And the issue here is that it's my <laughs> brain scan. And I, I, you may now understand why Philip was very concerned about your safety and your well-being. <laughs> but that's not the real reason for putting this up. It's to illustrate, of course, that imaging is not diagnostic in any way. There's lots of issues. 
with neuroscience in the courtroom. Stephen will come and talk about many of those is issues. So again, we mustn't oversimplify this, but we are beginning to gain some understanding about which brain mechanisms, when dysfunctional, might be a predisposition to later antisocial behavior. Now, um, you'll already seen the case of Phineas Gage here, and you heard about that story of the railway worker who was transformed into a psychopathic individual when he had this tamping rod blown through his prefrontal cortex. We were interested in looking at individuals in the community who are violent and antisocial and looking to see whether they have brains that are structurally different from the rest of us. Where do you get them from in the community? We found them in temporary employment agencies in downtown Los Angeles and recruited people from the temp agencies for three days. They did three days of work with us. The work they took part in is taking part in experiments, um, structural brain imaging, and we identified three basic groups, normal controls, those with drug and alcohol dependence, and you've heard a little bit about that from Anna, and 21 individuals with antisocial personality disorder, lifelong antisocial criminal offending. Um, these are the type of offences that these men perpetrated. Uh, none of them were caught for homicide or attempted homicide or firing a handgun at someone, uh, but about 50% had been caught for some type of offence. You'll see that the base rate of antisocial personality disorder in temp agencies is eight <laughs> times that of the normal population. And I know some of you do hire, have businesses, do hire people from temp agencies. The reason for that, of course, is that antisocial psychopathic people drift downwards in society. They're irresponsible, impulsive. So temp agencies are safe havens for them, essentially. The bottom line is this, that if you look at structural brain imaging of gray matter oops, in the prefrontal cortex, um, what you see is an 11% reduction in gray matter in that very frontal part of the brain that again is involved in emotion regulation and decision making. So literally, these antisocial psychopathic individuals have brains that are physically, structurally different to the rest of us. 